most of the stuff that I'm going to be covering is in the sediment computation options and tolerances menu, which you get to through the unsteady flow analysis. And then down here, click on this guy, and it opens up this editor. Some of these things are 1D, 2D. They apply to both 1D and 2D. Those are, in, you know, with the blue boxes. And the stuff that's only 1D is, is shown in green. In 2D, you can have bed roughness predictors. You have the computation multiplier, which allows you to use a larger time step for sediment compared to flow. And then this is all the, the warm-up periods that are used for sediment. Okay, the computation multiplier. Basically, use a, a larger time step for sediment than flow, and it's a multiplier. It's also used if you have an adaptive time step. So if you're adapting the time step for hydraulics and increasing it and decreasing it, halving and doubling, it keeps that M multiplier, right? But it's also going to match the output time interval. So if it decides that it needs to use a smaller multiplier um, or compute a, a smaller time step in order to hit the output time interval, it's going to do that. It reduces the computational time. Uh, the maximum value that, that I recommend is 20, but it just depends on the data set, like how dynamic your data set is, how fast things are changing in the bed and in, in the water column. Um, and by needs validation, it's not like, the, the method needs validation. You need to test how big you can get. This is like the hydrodynamic time step. You know, there's guidance, but you need to do a convergence analysis. Basically, like if, it, if you weren't using adaptive and you were just using a constant time step, you would try time step, look at your results, half the time step, look at your results, and then keep doing that until you see no change in your results. There's a similar convergence analysis for grid resolution where you have a resolution, you, you run the model, you have the resolution, run the model again, and when your results don't change, then you know you can, that's a proper resolution for your model. Bed roughness predictors, we have those three options. Um, I recommend the Van Ryn method for 2D, Lee Marino's. It's really for gravel and cobble streams. It, it, it only takes into account two variables, the hydraulic radius and D85, 84th percentile diameter. Um, and the Brownlee, Distrib uh, formula is okay, but there's some things that I don't like about it. There's a, a discontinuity between the lower and upper regime. It's kind of odd. This is a comparison of different methods. I actually have all of these programmed in the code, and so maybe we can add in a, in a subsequent version the other methods. Um, but in general, the Van Ryn one compares pretty well to the other ones, and even though it's kind of older than some of the other ones, it, it it's uh, pretty good. Um, uh, so for 2D, the one I, I, I recommend right now is the, the Van Ryn one, unless you're really, like, really, really want to use the other ones. This is the discontinuity I was talking about for the Brownlee equation I don't like. And then depending on the, your flow conditions, it may not even go from upper to lower regime, like in this case, you know. I have used them, but um, like you said, it they they um, with limited success. You know, I think it it's a a very like academic thing to do, or it's a very interesting thing to do. Like it, theoretically, it should be great, but in practice, it's not. Um, I think we just need to come up with better equations, bed form predictor equations. Places the only places where I've found them useful is in some sort of like gradational disequilibrium, like a dam removal, where you have gravel downstream and then you get a sand pulse, and it's like and you want the roughness to change. You want the response. roughness to change in response to that, and it's like dramatic enough that um, yeah, you'll, you'll see the difference, and it doesn't really matter if the difference is exactly right. You just need to see. The so th this does change the roughness in the hydraulics. It's not just for sediment, right? It's important that people understand that. So the initial conditions time. Here we're talking about uh, initial conditions. This is run um, at the beginning of the simulation. This is negative time. And th this is before the warm-up. So the initial conditions is running each 2D area kind of by itself and initializing each 2D area. The warm-up is, is then running all of the 2D areas and 1D, 2D combined and initializing that. 
for sediment, there's, there's three types of warm-up periods, concentration, gradation, and bathymetry. And depending on what value you choose for each one, it'll, you, you can be in a different kind of scenario. The hydraulic one is run first, and then concentration always, but then the gradation bathymetry ones are run together. And depending on which one is bigger, one will start before the other one. But the important thing is that by the end of that, the initial conditions period, you'll have concentration turned on, bathymetry and gradations all turned on, basically, in that scenario, right? Um, you may also choose to just run concentration. You know, you run initial conditions period for, uh, for hydraulics, and then you initialize concentrations. Um, and that's nice because if you start your model with clear water, you're going to pick up a bunch of sediment at the beginning of your model. Um, it's a little bit of erosion. It's not much. Uh, and there's no output for this time period. Um, matrix solver, this is one of the things that a lot of people don't ever change, and that's fine if, if you don't mind the dealing, if you don't want to deal with the iterative solvers. If you are concerned about run times and you want to make your, your model faster, this is a, like the number one thing. Because most of the computational time is spent solving the sparse matrices for each AD equation. Um, there's three solvers here. The Pardiso one is a direct solver. It's great because it gives you a direct solution every time. It's exact to numerical precision, but it can be rather slow. The other solvers are iterative, and so each time you call it, it gives you uh, a, uh, an approximate solution. And if you call it you know, iteratively, it gives you a better and better solution until you, you say, OK, I'm, I'm satisfied with the solution. Um, in sediment, we have, you know, a certain number of grain classes, and they're all coupled together, right? They're coupled because of the of the bed, right? And the transport could be also coupled through concentrations, and so we have an uh, an a loop, an outer loop, and so we're solving matrices over and over again, and that's one of the reasons why the iterative solvers, if you if you have uh, outer loop iterations, are really beneficial compared to the direct solver. Because if you're iterating, it doesn't really make sense to compute an exact solution of the matrix every iteration. It's better to compute an approximate solution, and as you converge to your solution, you get a better answer. If you do choose the iterative solvers, there are some tolerances that need, that need to be specified. At the moment, those are all hard-coded in, inside the code. And they're kind of based on these tolerances. Maybe at some point we'll expose them. In hydraulics, they are exposed. In sediment, we could do that, but we haven't done that. I, I always start with Pardiso, and that's the default because it's the most robust. But once you get your model going and you see that it's converging, you're getting good answers, switch to the iterative solvers. It's going to be maybe twice as fast or something like that, you know. That's true. But is this significant? I mean, this is sediment. I, we are, there's so much error with sediment. If, if you're converging to one to the minus six, you know, <laughs> milligrams per liter, that's fine, you know. The direct solver is exact in numerical precision, but you don't need that precision, really. It's excessive. These tolerances for the outer loop are really small, actually. I, like, once I get my model going, I'll sometimes increase those. Especially, I, d I do what I call exploratory runs where I'm just trying to get a feel for the project, what's happening, where, where are things occurring, what areas do I need to worry about, um, things like that. Is my resolution okay, the extent of my domain, and, you know, kind of learning about the project. And I, I'll, I'll play with these, these numbers to, to get faster runs for those. Yeah, iterative is faster, less stable. And that's kind of a theme with a lot of numerical methods that the, the uh, more accurate ones will be slower, and uh, the faster ones will be less accurate. OK. Um, implicit weighting factor, that's this guy right here. This applies to the transports, the advective and diffusive fluxes. Um, it doesn't apply to erosion and deposition. Those are treated f fully implicitly. I'm going to change that, but I did this for robust, robustness reasons. This, 
if you treat it fully implicitly, it's more robust, more stable. Um, but so what, what does it mean to, do, you know, to use 0.5 versus 1? Well, 0.5 is going to be more accurate. You're going to have less uh, numerical diffusion. And 1 is going to be the most stable. It's the most implicit. Um, so if, uh, if you have really high resolution mesh and you really wanted to reduce your numerical diffusion, you could reduce this to 0.5. Otherwise, I wouldn't worry about it. Most of our grids are pretty coarse, and we're looking at things at large scale. That's so not a big deal. Um, 